Welcome to Damn Good Movie Memories with your host, Ryan Davis. This podcast is the cure for your long commute and super boring work day. I will always remember. I'll always remember. I will always remember. I will always remember. Remember. I will always remember the girl next door. Whoa. Oh my. She's so hot. What channel, dude? Dude, what the? Matthew. Matthew, come down here. So what are we going to do about this? No. <laughs> Sorry. Dude. She comes to your house and she makes you strip, okay? Where's she to do this? Damn. Should've kissed her. So, you can figure this out. You just you need a girl. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? I don't know. Someone is gonna push him. Ooh, boxers. That's my principal. <laughs> You're friends with me, huh? Yeah. Well, we're, um... We're kinda going out. I incinerate! Someone is gonna make him do things he never thought he could do. Dude... I know. Get in. <laughs> Alright, what? Matthew, we live in a crazy world. That's not her. Yeah, it is. Cool. Matt, she's a porn star, okay? Dude, what would JFK do? Don't mess this up. <laughs> fine, fine, fine. Please, please, Matt. I just want to let you know you're better than this. <laughs> Always know if the juice is worth the squeeze. It means you don't steal my girl unless you're ready to accept the consequences. Things get bad, just bolt, okay? What happened? You got that. There's nothing you can do about it now. Yeah, there is. I mean. I'm all wet. Can I come in? Uh, uh. <laughs> I know. Dude. I know. I'm kind of uncomfortable watching this with Shh, you. Dude, learn to like it. Hey there, it's Brian Davis, and for this week's episode, we're going to cover the movie The Girl Next Door from 2004. Now, the studio was 20th Century Fox. The release date was April 9th, 2004. The running time, 108 minutes. The rating is R. The budget was $20 million, and the box office was a bust, making only back $14.5 million, making it the 122nd ranked movie of 2004. Rotten Tomatoes gave it 56% rotten from 159 reviews. The critics' consensus is the movie borrows heavily from risky business, though Hirsch and Cuthbert are appealing leads. Roger Ebert, no surprise, gives it 1.5 out of 4 stars. And his review is this. The studio should be ashamed of itself for advertising The Girl Next Door as a teenage comedy. It's a nasty piece of business involving a romance between a teenage porn actress and a high school senior. A good movie could presumably be made from this premise. A good movie can be made from anything, in the right hands and way. But this is a dishonest, queeze-inducing comedy that had me feeling uneasy and then unclean. Who in the world read the script and thought it would be acceptable? The film stars Emile Hirsch as Matthew Kidman. Please tell me that the Kidman is not an oblique reference to Nicole Kidman and therefore t to Tom Cruise and therefore to Risky Business, the film this one so desperately wants to resemble. One day he sees a sexy girl moving in next door, and soon he's watching through his bedroom window as she undresses as girls undress only in his dreams. Then she sees him, snaps off the light, and a few minutes later rings the doorbell. Has she come to complain? No, she says nothing about the incident and introduces herself as Danielle to Matthew's parents. Her aunt is on vacation and she is house-sitting. Soon, they're in the car together and Danielle is coming on to Matthew. Did you like what you saw? He did. She says now it's her turn to see him naked and makes him strip and stand in the middle of the road while she shines the headlights on him. Then she scoops up his underpants and drives away, leaving him to walk home naked. Ho oh, ho. It's not so easy to reach out of a car and scoop up underpants from the pavement while continuing to drive. <laughs> Try it sometime. <laughs> 
Danielle, played by Alicia Cuthbert, has two personalities. In one, she's sweet and misunderstood kid who has never been loved. And in the other, she's a twisted emotional sadist who amuses herself by toying with the feelings of the naive Matthew. The movie alternates between these personalities and its convenience, making her quite the most unpleasant character I have seen in some time. They have a romance going before one of Matthew's buddies identifies her correctly as a porn star. The movie seems to think, along with Matthew's friends, that this information is in her favor. Matthew goes through the standard formula. First, he's angry with her. Then she gets through his defenses. Then he believes she really loves him and that she wants to leave the life she's been leading. Problem is, her producer is angry because he wants her to keep working. This character, named Kelly, is played by Timothy Oliphant with a skill that would have distinguished a better movie, but it doesn't work here because the movie never levels with us. When a guy his age, 36 according to IMDb, used to be a, the boyfriend of a girl her age, which is 19 according to the plot description, and she is already at 19 a famous porn star, there was a good chance the creep corrupted her at an early age, thank Tracy Lords. That he is now her producer and under an exclusive contract is an elevated form of pimping. To act in porn as a teenager is not a decision freely taken by most teenage girls and not a life to envy. There's worse. The movie produces a basically a nice guy named Hugo Posh, played by James Ramar, also a porn king who is Kelly's rival. That a porn king saves the day gives you an idea of the movie's limited moral horizons. Oh, and not to forget Matthew's best friends named Eli and Klitz. Klitz, spelled with a K, he explains. Kelly steals the money that Matthew has raised to bring in a foreign exchange student from Cambodia, and then to replace the funds, the resourceful Danielle flies into porn star's friends, played by Amanda Swiston and Sung Hai Lee, so that Matthew, Eli, and Quitz can produce a sex film during the senior prom. The nature of their film is yet another bait and switch in a movie that wants to seem dirtier than it really is. Like a strip show at a carnival. It lures you in with promises of sleaze, and after you've committed yourself to the filthy-minded punter you are, it professes its innocence. Risky Business, which came out in 1983, you will recall, starred Tom Cruise as a young man left home alone by his parents, who wrecks the family Porsche and ends up enlisting a call girl, played by Rebecca de Mornay, to run a brothel out of his house to raise money to replace the car. The movie is the obvious model for The Girl Next Door, but it completely misses the tone and wit of the earlier film, which proved you can get away with that plot, but you have to know what you're doing and how to do it. Two pieces of knowledge conspicuously absent here. One necessary element is to distance the heroine from the seamier side of her life. The girl next door does the opposite, actually taking Danielle and her producer, Kelly, to an adult film convention in Las Vegas and even into a dimly lit room where adult stars apparently pleasure the clients. There's another scene where Kelly, pretending to be Matthew's friend, takes him to the lap dance emporium and treats him. We can deal with the porn stars, lap dances, and whatever else in a movie that declares itself and plays fair, but to insert this material into something with the look and feel of a teen comedy makes it unsettling. The TV ads will attract audiences expecting something like American Pie. They'll be shocked by the squalid content of this film. And that is the end. While I don't despise the movie like Roger Ebert does, I do own it after all, I do agree with some of his points. The film sort of wants to have it both ways, just like Ebert predicted his in his review when the movie was first released. I was under the impression this was a teen comedy, maybe with a little sex thrown in, similar to American Pie and earlier sex comedies from the 1980s. However, this movie is way darker than it should have been. And while I do enjoy the film, I can understand why this movie would turn off viewers who felt like they've been bait and switch by the misleading promotion of this film. To be honest, I totally missed it when it was released to theaters in, in 2004, and I'm not sure why, to be honest. It's a sort of genre I've always enjoyed, but as a, you know, as the box office total showed, it was a box office bust, and was probably out of theaters before I even real, realized I wanted to see it. So once I saw it on DVD, I enjoyed the film for what it was and accepted many of the flaws explained by Roger Ebert. All right, let's get into the main cast. Again, you have Emil Hirsch, who plays Matthew Kidman. Uh, this was the first movie I saw Hirsch in, and up until this movie, he was mostly acting in bit roles on television until his big break in the 2002 movie with Kevin Klein called The Emperor's Club. 
I think that the producers probably thought this film would make him a star, that being The Girl Next Door, and he does deliver a fine performance, but the film was a flop, and, you know, Hirsch continues to appear consistently in film and television today. Alicia Cuthbert plays Danielle, and Cuthbert was definitely the draw to this film for many, especially young males like myself. At this point, she was probably best known for playing Jack Bauer's daughter in the hugely successful television show, 24. Jack Bauer was, of course, Keith Sutherland. She also had a bit role in Old School as well. Timothy Oliphant plays Kelly, and I likely saw Oliphant the first time in Scream 2, but his most memorable role was the super fun movie called Go from 1999, where he plays a crazy drug dealer. This wasn't too far removed from his role as Kelly in this movie. Elephant continues to be terrific in character and orally roles, and my most recent favorite with him is as Drew Barrymore's husband in the Netflix series The Santa Clarita Diet. The director was Luke Greenfield, and prior to The Girl Next Door, Greenfield directed the Rob Schneider comedy The Animal, which I do remember seeing in the theater, and it wasn't that good. After The Girl Next Door, he pretty much directed TV movies with 2011's Something Borrowed and 2014's Let's Be Cops being the film exceptions for widescreen audiences. All right, let's just get right into the movie. The film starts off with seductive talking between a male and female, and all you see is red lips and a camera. Of course, as we predicted, this is just a ruse, as it's simply a photo shoot for a high school senior portrait. As we discover with this film, the film implies sex far more than actually seeing anything sexual in the film. You get to hear from the popular students their most memorable moments from high school while Queens Under Pressure plays in the background. It's actually a fun montage, even if it's been done many times before. Yeah. Okay. You ready? Yeah. You're blushing, Kathy. <laughs> okay, and big smile. Kathy Reagan. I will always remember. The game against Fairfield. That one final kick. State champion senior year. Hunter McCaffrey. I will always remember all the great times with the dirty dozen. And Mackin, all the honeys. Cindy K, Tina B, Michelle H. God damn, just too many to remember. Yeah! I'll always remember lacrosse champions. All the glory days with the boys. I will always remember the math club madmen. Making the perfect fake IDs, which lasted six seconds. Troy Cochran. Troy Cochran. Troy gives good head. Fuck you. I'll always remember the senior prank. Then we get our protagonist, Matthew Kidman, of course, Emile Hirsch. And Matthew is a super smart, and he is in contention to be valedictorian. This is where the film follows the typical high school cliches. He's, he's finally realized uh, when his high school years are about to end that he's missed every opportunity to have fun because he's been so focused on getting into the best college possible. He gets into Georgetown, but again, he needs that scholarship. He must win an essay contest to obtain the scholarship. Personally, I think it's easy to get hung up on just achievements as the highlights of your life. Sometimes it's a, the, the journey itself that's a lot more meaningful than just the positive outcomes. Your life is kind of shaped about how you grow, not just when you're successful. You know, it's kind of like winning and losing in sporting events. You learn more by losing because you're going to lose far more often than you win. His two buddies are Paul Dano and Chris Marquette, and they're typical horny males who just want to be close to anything female. Marquette is far more overt than Dano, and he has a bit of a porn habit. <laughs> Not internet porn, but actual old school DVDs. Way to go. Dano and Marquette work well together as the side friends to the main star, Hirsch. I best remember Dano as the angry teenager who never speaks in Little Miss Sunshine. There's a funny scene at the rally in the gym where Hirsch tells the students that the school raised enough money, $25,000, to bring out a genius ex exchange student from Cambodia to America to stay and study. This, of course, leads to the typical inappropriate comments from the students, most of which I probably would have done <laughs> obnoxiously in high school as well. Stuff like, I want to bang you! Show that shit! When they were talking about the <laughs> show in the video. <laughs> it's funny, I don't know. I never grew up. How you doing? Okay, 
uh, let's start off with Operation Get Some Young. Yeah. Uh, well, we did it. Uh, we raised the $25,000. So now we can bring the genius Sam Young out of Cambodia and bring him here to study at Westport. Speaking of which, um, Sam Young sent us a new tape. to be coming soon. Are you excited? Yeah. I told my class that I'm coming to America. It was sad. I'm so happy. I'm on a the thing about this movie is that it's filled with scenes that you think are real but quickly turn into something else. This is the fun part of the film, and frankly, it sets it apart from other teen comedies of the genre. So while Hirsch is trying to focus on getting a scholarship, a mysterious girl moves next door named Danielle. Of course, that's Alicia Cuthbert. Cuthbert is drop-dead gorgeous, and Hirsch can only focus on her. Of course, we get the typical young male fantasy as both Hirsch and Cuthbert have upstairs bedrooms, and Hirsch just happens to be looking out his window as, as Cuthbert decides to get undressed. It's played out, but then again, it's every young male's fantasy as well, which is why it's in the movie. Unfortunately for Hirsch, Cath- Cuthbert catches him and decides to come over to his house and confront him. And here is where the film takes a fun turn. You think Cuthbert is going to rat Hirsch out to his parents. Instead, we find out she's staying at her aunt's house for a few weeks while her aunt is on vacation. Hirsch's parents suggest that he shows her around town. Lucky him! Until she decides that since he got to see her undressed, it's only fair that he do the same for her. It's a fun scene that is better seen than me describing. So while it's predictable, we quickly discover that Cuthbert is the person to bring Hirsch out of his shell. He decides to spontaneously ditch school in the middle of class to hang out with Cuthbert for the day. And so you get the obligatory date montage. However, this is kind of like movie comfort food. It just works for teen comedies. It harkens back to Can't Buy Me Love and other fun teen comedies. The songs playing in this film are interesting. It's kind of an eclectic mix of old and new, which in 2004 was pre-play with soundtracks that is so commonplace today. The director was thinking about these songs as he wrote the film, so it makes sense, and the, you know, the, music, the music works pretty well. You hear stuff from Elliot Smith, Echo and the Bunnymen, Harry Nilsson, Thunderclap Newman, uh, Filter, David Gray, Monster Magnet, The Sneaker Pimps, Red House Painters, Unfortunately, Methods of Mayhem, <laughs> what a shitty band that was from Tommy Lee, Pete Yorn, the James Gang, of course you gotta have Funk 49, Patti LaBelle, Leonard Skinner, Marvin Gaye, Muddy Waters, The Verb, Donovan, and others. So it's interesting, their gym class actually had fencing as a sport, so this is probably a uh, well-to-do high school. Another high school cliche, the big party where the less popular kids attend the popular kids' party. Hirsch obviously becomes the center of attention since he brings Cuthbert to the party, who stands out more than anyone else. However, this is where Hirsch decides to break his routine of being a doormat and decides to take charge of his life. And right when we think the movie is going to follow that typical high school teen comedy, Hirsch's porn-addicted buddy Eli, that's Marquette, discovers that Cuthbert is a porn star and the film becomes its own tale unlike any other teen comedy. Now, this could have taken the more wholesome adventures and babysitting route, like when Elizabeth Shue is mistaken for a Playboy centerfold who looked like her. Well, (laughs) that is not this movie. And what's too bad is that the promotion campaign about the film basically gave away this plot point. It would have been better if the viewer didn't know this going into the film, but it's sort of a double-edged sword since it was initially the draw for many to this film. But it also might have been why the film didn't take off when it was originally released to theaters. One thing we learn is to never listen to your buddies about advice about dating, especially when they're forever single. Hirsch learns this lesson the hard way. No pun intended. What makes this r- movie r- kind of interesting is Timothy Oliphant. He's so sleazy, he's despicable, that you hate everything about him. And, but that's what makes this film stand out. You need a villain like him to take the you know for, to take the movie to a certain arc. And I wouldn't call him Cuthbert's pimp like Ebert, but that's essentially what he is. <laughs> he's basically her producer agent, but she isn't able to get away from his attachment on her. 
So you could assume she has father issues, and that would be the attraction to someone like Oliphant, but the film doesn't get into that sort of plot line. So Oliphant takes both Hirsch and Cuthbert to a strip club where Hirsch sees his friend sees a friend of his parents. There's a funny scene where they both awkwardly get lap dances next to each other while making small talk. This is actually was probably part of the unrated version on DVD since I never actually saw it in the theater, so I'm assuming... Uh, neither did theater goers. We again see the evolution or de-evolution of Hirsch's character as he decides to go to Vegas to a porn convention to follow Cuthbert and try to get her out of the grasp of Oliphant. This is a bad idea as we see Oliphant's true colors very quickly when he feels his property is being messed with. One thing is that we really never discover is why Cuthbert gets into the porn business to begin with. Again, I can only assume daddy issues that were never mentioned earlier, and that's likely the reason. I'm not sure if it really matters, but it would maybe have added some depth to the plot line. Hirsch's two buddies again are hilarious at the porn convention as they try to convince a porn star that they're movie producers. Hi. Dude, am I ugly? What? No, no, man, you're fine. Just, just relax. No, I'm ugly, I know it. So, what do you guys do? I get freaky. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we're directors. Really? Would you guys ever want to use me in one of your movies? Uh, hell yeah, we'll use you. Baby, I'll do things to you I wouldn't do to a farm man. What the fuck did you just say? Honey, these guys are directors, and they want to use me. Use you? Guys, this is my boyfriend, Mule. Uh, hi, Mule. Let's do it. Man, you gotta use my girl, bro. She's so good. I am. I really am. You want to give her a throw? Yeah. Try me out. <sighs> nah, you know, no, nah, I'm okay, though. Thank you. Well, come on. At least feel her tits. I, uh, I'm okay. I, I can't. Thank you, though. <laughs> Fuck it. I'll feel one. <laughs> Not bad, huh? Suckers cost me six grand. <sighs> Yo, Mule. What the hell are you doing? Steel, check it out, man. These guys are directors. <laughs> man, these punks ain't directors. They're in high school, you idiot. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. Oh, shit! I'm a Maddie, time to go, time to go, time to go. What happened? He got that. Bolt, bolt! After Las Vegas, things take a definite crazy turn. And I don't want to give away anything <laughs> because basically all the plot twists and eventual outcome occur in the final hour of the film. The Ebert review kind of gave you some hints of what happens, but the final hour is where the girl next door stands apart from most teen movies. Usually it's the first hour when the movie is great and then falls apart. If anything, the movie gets better for me after the first hour. Another memorable scene is when Hirsch is dosed with ecstasy without him knowing, and he must give a speech for his scholarship. Basically, it's not wise to give an important speech on drugs. Then again, eh, maybe it is. My teachers, but my best teacher has always been my mother. A woman who worked three jobs trying to support me ever since I was a little niña. I will never forget the day she said to me, Si trabajas duro, todo es posible. And that is why I have always tried to answer the call of the great John F. Kennedy, who urged us to ask not what your country... <laughs> Let's see here, um... Can't speak a foreign language, so that's out. And I, uh, I certainly can't quote JFK now. Can I, Ryan? You know, it, it's funny, I've, I have this whole speech prepared, and I've been, I've been practicing for weeks, but you know what? I'm just gonna go with it. 
moral fiber. So what is moral fiber? I mean, it's, it's funny. I used to think it was always telling the truth, doing good deeds, you know, basically being a fucking Boy Scout. But lately I've been seeing it differently. Now I think that moral fiber is about finding that one thing you really care about. That one special thing that means more to you than anything else in the world. And when you find her, you fight for her. You risk it all. You put her in front of everything. Your future, your life, all of it. And maybe the stuff you do to help her isn't so clean. You know what? It doesn't matter. Because in your heart, you know that the juice is worth the squeeze. That's what moral fiber is all about. So the plot hits its crescendo at the prom towards the end of the film, which is a great cat and mouse game. But again, there are some great twists that keep you guessing where the film is going to end up. And so while Ebert might not have enjoyed it, this movie isn't for him, frankly. And hey, the film ends up with the Who's Baba O'Reilly, which even if you don't like the film, you gotta love that song. I wish Cuthbert said about the movie... Um, that it's, it very easily could have been called The Boy Next Door, since it's really his story. I think that Cuthbert is kind of perfect for this role, since she really doesn't look like a stereotypical porn star. If she did, I don't think the movie could have worked as well. All right, some fun facts. Uh, the DVD has a fun short featurette that is called The Eli Experience, where they basically do a candid camera shtick at the actual porn convention in Vegas. Olivia Wilde actually had a small role as one of the popular girls at the high school in its Wilde's first movie role. The original ending actually had a shot of her smoking a cigar at the White House. It's sort of dumb, and I'm glad they didn't keep it. Actually, I think the unrated director's cut version would have worked better as the theatrical version, and maybe that's what watered down the you know the original film and therefore hurt it. Uh, but again, I've only seen the unrated version. Interestingly, the film grossed more money outside of the United States. As uh, Emil Hirsch was still a minor during uh, production, all of his nude scenes were performed as by a stunt double, and for the lap dance scene, several pillows were placed between him and the dancer. Oh, how unlucky. Alicia Cuthbert filmed the movie while she was still filming 24, and when she was asked about the, asked about the hectic schedule, she said, Our weekends were Monday and Tuesday, and the show was obviously Saturday and Sunday, so every day it was basically for three months. Jay Moore actually auditioned for the role of Kelly, uh, but was told the part had gone to Matt Dillon. The part of Kelly, of course, would have gone to Timothy Oliphant, who had passed on the part twice before agreeing to take the role. Emil Hirsch and Paul Dano uh, previously appeared in The Emperor's Club together. So, should you see this movie? Depends how you feel about, uh, you know, the teen sex comedies. But again, it's not going to follow the typical trope. Uh, this movie probably isn't for everyone. It's not the best movie ever. Is it turn off your brain movie? Yeah, that's what it is. And I would assume this appeals more to men than women, but who knows? You know, I'm not going to generalize here. But uh, yeah, give it a shot. If you kind of like American Pie, if you like, again, it's not as good as Rick Risky Business, but it does kind of follow that trope. Give it a shot. You may like it. I'm sure it's free all over the place. Anyway, we do have a guest. We're going to talk to Keith Rochford to see what how he feels about this movie and if it holds up. And I'll talk to you next week. Okay, we're back with our very special guest. It's been too long. Keith Rochford, how's it going, Keith? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Brian? I'm great. And uh, we're going to talk about, I'm not going to call it a classic. I'm going to call it a very fun movie. And that is The Girl Next Door from 2004. I always give my list to to the regular guests about what movies they want to pick. And uh, this was one of the few movies Keith uh, said, yeah, I can do this one. And so do you did you see this originally when it first came out? I did not. It was one of those. I think I'm going to buy it just because I'm in the mood for some goofy comedy. But I didn't see it at the theaters. I I bought it on DVD when it first came out. Uh, It did do well at the box office initially. Um I don't know if it was kind of like a bait and switch where I think people really thought they were going to get a lot of nudity, kind of like early 80s uh, sex comedy like Porky's or something like that. And there definitely is nudity, but it's not as um, rambunctious as the trailer and definitely the cover makes it, you know, seem like. No, exactly. That's it. I was I was thinking the same thing when I remember the commercials for it. 
even rewatching it, the whole scene of where she rings the doorbell and asks to come in. Mm-hmm. That was that was part of the trailer and in the commercials for it and the ads and there it was setting it up to be more of like an American Pie type old school mix movie of that genre of over the top, you know, goofy, crazy comedy, you know, sex and drugs everywhere. And it definitely wasn't that kind of movie. No, not at all. Now, had you seen, uh, had you been watching 24, the TV show before this movie? I never watched it whatsoever. I did remember the actress from old school though. Okay. So Alicia Cuthbert, you remember her from that. Okay. Cause most people remember her as Jack Bauer's, uh, daughter, which is Keith Sutherland in the uh, in the 24 series. So that's interesting. Uh, yeah, and she really hasn't done much, as far as I remember, uh, since then. <laughs> so I don't no, know. No, I think I was, I was, yeah. yeah, I was looking it up, and I think she did uh, the second time that they did the 24 with uh, a couple different characters. I think she did a couple cameos, but from what I, I gathered, it looked like she was just you know raising a family and whatnot, and just doing little small roles here and there. So I I know she married a professional hockey player, so. Maybe did not need to work. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. So what did you think of uh, the, the movie and what did you think of the cast? And uh, yeah, just give me your thoughts about the first time you saw it. And obviously it resonated with you. Uh, you know, I, I, I was probably in the same mind frame of everybody else when they first saw it. If they went and saw it at a theater was I'm going to throw this on. It's going to be one of those movies that you have on, you know, when you have friends over. And it definitely wasn't that I didn't go back to it all that much as I would have like. Again, the American Pie, the the old school style movies. Um, but then, if you if you sat and just had it, it was more of like a date movie, really, like a, a romantic comedy. It wasn't a teen comedy. Right. It starts off kind of like that at first. And there's another movie out there, and I don't remember the name of it. It might be one of those uh, extra American Pie movies or something. Where <laughs> the guys make you know a porno later on, and they sell it and. I know I've seen it either on Netflix or something. I can't remember the name of it. And that's what I kept thinking that 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 movie was going to be. But they made a totally different change on it. But it was good for what, you know, what you were what you weren't expecting. If you got that out of the way and years had gone by since I watched it again over the weekend. And it was actually pretty cool. You know, a, a sweet movie, we'll say. Yeah. And there's some twists in the movie that I wasn't expecting the first time I saw it, which was good. And um, I, I think it's it it kind of lent itself to being uh, kind of a dark horse if you had stuck with it. But I think some people may have thought, ah, I know where this is going. And then they just kind of turned it off and, and didn't really you know, stick with it. But I think Timothy Oliphant definitely makes this movie without him. I, I'm not sure this movie would even have been released to be honest with you. No. I, and that's one of my notes. He, he's a, a great character actor. He's, he's never been really the lead that in anything that I've seen. Um, but he always plays a, a really good role. He's a, he's a strong actor. I mean, I've seen him gone in 60 seconds, catch and right. release. And, you know, who can forget, you know, his hole and a half in Rockstar. That's right. <laughs> did you see it? <laughs> did that, yeah, he's great in that. <laughs> did you see him in Go? Uh, I don't remember Go at all. Okay, that's one. I, I own that. So eventually we'll be doing that one. That one's a good one to revisit uh, if you like him. And then I really enjoyed it. It just got canceled. But the Santa Clarita Diet with um, Drew Barrymore, the Netflix okay. series. That was uh, if you're into kind of the horror comedy, uh, I, it's well done because I, I love Drew Barrymore. And, and obviously, Tim, Tim Timothy is really good. Yeah, I, I do enjoy his, his his acting. He seems to be really cool about it. It's it's kind of like a, an an everyman kind of personality that you get with him. Nothing over the top crazy or, you know, like in a guy looking at another dude, he's like, it's not like he's too pretty like Brad Pitt to look at and go, oh, right. This dude can <laughs> act, but there's another great character actor. I think they underutilized a bit, which was James Remar. Ah, uh, yes, absolutely. Cause he plays uh, Hugo Posh, the, uh, the porn King. Yeah. And he was only in a few scenes, but he, he, he like, ate the scenery when he was in those scenes he really did now how did you feel about the buddies because obviously emile hirsch is the lead character uh but paul dano and uh chris marquette as eli and uh clitz great name with a k and uh yeah how did you how did you feel about those guys they were i mean they they fit the role perfectly um it again it just it was a lot of it was taking your cliche type of teenage you know nerds and geeks and kind of putting them together and making a movie you know you can kind of 
take his one buddy and trade him off for McLovin. It was kind of the same ideal when I was think, looking at the characters, but they all seem to gel really well on screen together and they, they look the part, so that worked out too. That's true. Do you recommend this to, to someone who's in this type of genre? And uh, do you think you'd ever revisit it this after uh, this episode? I don't know if I'd revisit it. it like I said earlier, it, it could be a date night movie type thing, but because of that whole porn undercurrent, it kind of isn't. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not a, a family rom-com, definitely. No. And it, it depends on what type of date night you're having, I guess. So it's one of those oddball movies that really doesn't fit into any genre, unfortunately. I think that could be why it got overlooked so much and people never went back to go see it. Yeah, that's uh, a great point. And that's, it kind of reminds me, I remember uh, Zach and Mary make a porno. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I remember that. Yeah, that and if, you couldn't even buy it at like Target or Walmart with the full title. It just said Zach and Mary. Right. <laughs> and that one is definitely the same thing. Like it, it teases more than actually, you know, delivers on that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kevin Smith was just trying to go over the top at that point. I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, again, it's been great having you on, Keith. And uh, we'll, we'll I'm sure we're going to hear from you real soon. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me. And I look forward to talking some more movies with you. Awesome. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Hey, this is Brian Davis, and you might know me from the Damn Good Movie Memories podcast. And now, get ready for the Bad Beat Show on ThatMetalStation.com from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern every Wednesday night. I'm going to play some kick-ass hard rock inspired by the blues, because after all, the foundation of all things rock and metal is, of course, the blues. So join me every Wednesday night for the Bad Beat, because even when you lose, you still win. We are officially on Spotify now, so if you don't use iTunes, if you don't use the Podbean app, you can go to Spotify and get all of our past episodes. You can stream it on there, so if you're a Spotify user, you can go find Damn Good Movie... (laughs) I can't even say my own podcast. Damn Good Movie Memories. Yes, I know what I'm talking about. I'm the host, right? Okay, so go to Spotify, look for Damn Good Movie Memories. You can stream all of that stuff. And yeah, so if you don't want to use iTunes, you don't want to use Podbean, you can use Spotify as well. All right, before we sign off, we do have t-shirts are available for sale. All you have to do is go to TeePublic, that's T-E-E-P-U-B-L-I-C dot com, and you can get your very own Damn Good Movie Memories t-shirt. You can get all sizes, any gender, you can get whatever you want just at the tip of your fingers. So just go to TeePublic dot com, look up Damn Good Movie Memories, and you can get your very own t-shirt. If you enjoy this podcast and are an iTunes user, please do the show a favor and head on over to the official iTunes page for Damn Good Movie Memories. Be sure to leave a rating and a review. This will allow the show to appear higher in the algorithm and spread the joy of this podcast to the masses. If you are not an iTunes user, you can still listen and subscribe on Podbean at damngoodmoviememories.podbean.com. Be sure to like us on Facebook under our Damn Good Movie Memories page. You can also listen to a limited number of episodes on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and be sure to tune in next week for an all new episode of Damn Good Movie Memories. I am Dr. Fuck. And I'm the actual alcoholic. And we are part of the Rock and Metal Combat Podcast. We are the Rock and Metal Combat Podcast. That's right. And the way you can check us out is we are on iTunes and also Podbeam. And we forgot a review recently. I got this review right here. It says right here, it says, Rock and Metal Combat Podcast is the greatest podcast in the world. And it's my number one podcast signed by Science. Now, and then Science also says... Science! Science also said... My second favorite podcast is It Doesn't Matter, The Rest Suck. Rock and Metal Combat Podcast on iTunes and Poppy. Check it out. Science! Are you ready for the hottest new podcast out there? Check out the Vieira Vault, featuring none other than Dr. Fuck Ralph Vieira. You will hear personal stories and personal songs from the vault. There ain't nothing else like it. The one, the only, the original Vieira Vault on Podbean, 
Stitcher.com and iTunes. Spreaker. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this is Stephen Michael from the Growing Up Rock Podcast. If you're like me and my co-host, Sonny Hollywood Pooney, you grew up loving hard rock and metal music. Check out our podcast where we talk to bands and artists that help create the soundtrack to our lives, along with playing some killer new and old deep tracks of kick-ass guitar-driven rock and roll. Find us wherever you find your podcast to listen to, that's the Growing Up Rock Podcast, G-R-O-W-I-N-U-P-R-O-C-K. And feel free to hit us up at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at Growing Up Rock. So sit back and crank it up. <laughs> 